So, um, so chapter two dealt with statistics only consisting of one variable. When we had one variable, we, we computed an average, we computed things like quartiles, standard deviation. In other words, we kind of knew information about the data, about how spread apart it is, what the average value was, what the median was, and so on. In two variable data, we need to know the average and those sorts of statistics of both uh, X and Y. Basically, we're plotting a dependent variable against an independent variable. Now, if you do science class and you probably have these things plotted, the independent variable is usually time. And if time is involved in a study at all, and if time is one of the two measurements that are involved in that study, it is just about certain that time will be on the x-axis. And that's because time is always the independent variable in those sorts of measurements. You might want to remember that. Time doesn't depend on anything, but lots of things depend on time, right? Speed, uh, acceleration, things like that. And that's coming from science. But you could also say, you know, uh, rate of inflation over the year 2019, you know? So that's t all of that information is tied to whatever month the statistics happen to be gathered in and so on. So um, the idea of statistics of two variables is kind of a, a key thing here because measuring something with respect to time is really what a lot of your science courses are about. Um, you know, if you're in chemistry, it's rate of reaction. If you're doing physics, it's speed of an object, um, and so on. You can also measure population growth over time. So there's its rel relevance to biology. And we saw that from the last vid, from, uh, well, you, you might have seen those sorts of things in grade 11, in grade 11 mathematics, if you've done the either the 3U or the 3M courses. So our first uh, thing that we're going to do, by the way, you might want to familiarize yourself with the review of prerequisite skills. There's a couple of rather curious symbols here, and I want to draw your attention to questions six and seven. It may be possible that uh, you may not have seen these sort of symbols before. I'm going to do something here on MS Word that shows you what these things mean. I'm going to bring up a, an equation editor and I'm going to also have the toolbar. I guess I should have the toolbar. Let's bring down the, um, bring down the menu first. Hold on a minute. Tack that on and also, now, now that I'm here, I wonder why I'm not able to, oh yeah, I can type an equation. Oh, sorry. I missed it. Here's the equation. Um, here's the equation tab. That equation tab only comes up in Microsoft Word when you ha when you're in the equation editor. And what I wanted to do, these are for like big things, big operators. Here we go, a large operator, and we want the full blown summation notation. This letter here is the capital letter sigma. There's a Greek capital letter. And you can see here, I'll, I'll try out this one. I equals 1, 8, and I. Okay, so let's just try that over here. I equals 1. You'd probably... You'd probably... Um, would be, be almost better off to um, watch me do this by hand. But the I equals one part says that the variable we're using for counting is I. We are counting in the set of integers. And we're counting starting from one. So the lower limit of the counting is one. The upper limit of the counting, as you can see, is on the upper part of the sigma. And that's the number eight. So we're counting from one to eight. And the variable we replace I with is given right in front in this formula in front of sigma, and while the formula only consists of the letter i and nothing else. 
Sigma, so what the heck is Sigma then? What is all this? Sigma is asking you to add a list of numbers together. That's it. That's all Sigma does. It's just that it's a compact notation that is exactly the same as typing this out. 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5 plus 6 plus 7 plus 8. Okay? So it's actually taking the place of all of this stuff. And if the list was a lot longer than this, thank God we have summation notation to make things a lot more compact. So then, well, what is the sum? We can just add these up. 7 and 8 is 15, and 6 is 21, and 5 is 26, and 4 is 30, and 1, 2, 3 is 36. I believe the total is 36, he says without a calculator. So that's our first, um, our first look at sums. But sometimes it isn't so simple. Sometimes there's a formula in front. And for example, um, okay, how about, how, well, let's just try something, you know what, how about if we do this? I'm going to do the same thing as before, and I'm going to type it here, except I'm not going to do I. How about if I do this? Um, in brackets, I squared, oh, sorry, try that again. Try that again. I squared minus 1. And I'm just going to keep that in brackets. And on the other side, I'm going to have I squared minus 1. Well, 1, one squared minus 1 plus 2 squared minus 1 plus 3, oops, sorry, you know what? I, I'm not going to go as far as 8. How about if we just don't go all the way to 8? This is going to get tedious. I'll just go to 5. How's that? Even 5 is a bit hard, is a bit far, but we'll, we'll do it. We'll do 3 squared minus 1 and then plus 4 squared. Notice we're just repeatedly plugging numbers in from the lower limit to the upper limit one at a time, and then adding the results together, right? Let's do two more. 4 squared minus 1, and finally 5 squared. Oh, forgot the brackets. 5 squared minus 1. Okay, what is that equal to? Well, it's equal to 0 plus, what's 2 squared minus 1? 2 squared is 4, minus 1 is 3. And then, what's 3 squared minus 1? Well, 3 squared is 9, minus 1 is 8. And what's 4 squared minus 1? Well, it's 16 minus 1, which is 15. 5 squared minus 1 is 25 minus 1, which is 24. Okay, so then, what do we got? 3 and 8 is 11. 11 and 15 is 26. 26 and 24 make 50. That's a nice result. I, I, wasn't, uh, I wasn't aiming for that result. This is just trying to get you to see when something goes a little bit different, what summation does. Another thing too, um, what, about, what about something like this? Because really, um, okay, really this is a little closer to the kind of math you'll be doing, uh, 7b. Actually, 7a as well. Now, notice we have i here. i is still a counter. Our counter is i, and it's going from 1 to 6. Each time we are subtracting bar x. Remember, bar x is our average. And bar x is given in the question. So, okay. What if we did that? So we go from 1 to 6. Actually, I'd like to do this one just because it's a little more involved and it has fewer terms. So i equals 1 to 4, and we're adding together i minus bar x squared. Okay, so let's try another one. And um, so a uh, large operator here, we just got to grab that. And 
i equals 1 to it's being stubborn 4 and i minus x bar now I know I don't have the x bar here but I just gotta highlight the x and I believe let's go to the accent thing here in Microsoft Word one of these has a bar there we go okay now we were told we were told that bar x was two and a half so let's do this again we can write oh hold on we can rewrite this summation in this manner hold on I'm just gonna do this again okay except instead of bar X I'm gonna say 2.5 so this means I gotta go 1 minus 2.5 squared plus 2 minus 2.5 squared plus 3 minus, oh sorry, brackets, 3 minus 2.5 squared, oh, squared, and finally 4, 4 in brackets, 4 minus 4, uh, 2.5 squared okay and work this out on my calculator 1 minus 2.5 is negative 1.5 squared and when we square that we square negative 1.5 we get positive 2.25 we got a positive number notice that this looks an awful light a lot like how we would compute standard deviation which is right this is exactly how we do it, and this is the compact notation in statistics that is used to show standard deviation. 2.25 plus, uh, let's see, 2 minus 2.5, well, that's 0 0.5, negative 0 0.5, which ends up when we square it, it's positive 0 0.25, and then plus um, 3 minus 2.5, well, that's positive 0.5, and that still means 0 0.25 positive and one more 4 minus 2.5 squared which is oh sorry plus 1.5 4 is 1.5 bigger than 2.5 1.5 squared is 2.25 and now what do we got 2.25 and 2.25 that's four and a half and another half make five so here we have the sum of the squares being 5, and if we use 4 data, then the sum of the squares divided by 4 would be 5 quarters, or 1.25 would be the standard deviation of these four numbers. This is how we do uh, standard deviation, if you remember, uh, from Chapter 2. The general formula for standard deviation is to do, well, just bring this out. And here we go, I, oh sorry, I equals 1 to, sorry, I equals 1 to N. N is the number of data in the sample. And then we say X sub I, the ith measurement, minus uh, bar X so I'm just gonna go like that and I'm going to cover this and look for the accent thing and that goes there and we're squaring this but it isn't just that oh hold on um, didn't mean to do that oh that was a strange one okay let's here we go I think that's what I wanted that's what I was after but uh, this is the standard deviation. So if this is the population standard deviation, this is the sum of the squares divided by n. And this would be um, this would be the um, sigma sigma squared for the variance. 
and uh, that's um, that's the um, that's the population standard deviation if you recall from chapter two and um, there's another one of course there's the um, Actually, that's not the population standard deviation. That's the population variance. Remember, the standard deviation is the square root of the variance. So that uh, sigma uh, equals the square root square root of this whole thing. Just I gotta highlight this whole thing and bring that into that little box. There we go. So there's the standard deviation, there's the variance for x. That's kind of what this is hinting at, this kind of thing, okay? Um, and I don't mind, I don't mind uh, di digressing in that manner. Now, scatter plots are one thing. But the goal in our course is to be a little more ambitious. We're also going to discuss linear correlation, um, meaning that we're going to also discuss how strongly two variables are correlated to each other. So we could do a scatter plot. It wouldn't be a bad idea. The thing about the correlation on the spreadsheet is actually quite simple and you don't have to go mucking about with these sorts of summation notation things. So this is the Rogers method. And this is ours. And this is the score. And here we're going to have the Lang system. And this is ours and the score. So we're just going to um, here. I guess we have how many measurements? Nine. So three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and then we go across and we are going to do what? We want to have borders on these things to make it look more like a table. So I'm just going to copy these numbers down because I don't believe there's a way I can directly paste these. So 10, 12, and then 15, 16. Ours is something that is <coughs> going to be plotted on the x-axis, and the score is going to be dependent on the hours, which is the, the thinking behind this. The more hours of training, the higher the score. That's how we think about correlation. Okay, so if we looked at this, and hold on, here, let's just get rid of that. Okay, and then we go to insert and then chart. This time, this is going to be a scatter plot, as you can see. And this scatter plot is actually not bad. It's, uh, as you can see, it's showing quite a. Um, a little bit, you get a, a an idea of a little bit of a progression here from uh, the lowest number to the highest number. Uh, and as you can see, they don't neatly fit onto a line, but you wouldn't expect them to. We're just talking about dog training here. We're not talking about physics or anything rigorous like that. So when training dogs, some dogs are going to be smarter, some dogs not so not so much. And uh, will and some dogs are more responsive to training than others, and maybe some trainers are better than others, and maybe the Rogers method is a worse method, or maybe it's a better method. Who knows? But to get a sense of the correlation, you double click on a point on a data point, and you go down to where it says trend line here, and linear is exactly what you want. That's the default. And that's exactly what you want because it's a linear correlation and this is the line being plotted. Anyway, um, I'm going to use the equation for the label and notice that I have a slope 0.948 and a y-intercept of 3.08, which kind of tells you the y-intercept of 3.08 predicts that without any training, 
a dog will get a behavior score of 3.08 when given a, a, a be, an obedience test of some kind, okay, without, without any training at all. Now, it doesn't say here what the, um, what the correlation is, uh, but you can get a sense that the points are very close to the line. I'll make, it, make this a little taller. But you can get a sense that the points are very close to the line. So you get a sense that the, um, that the uh, correlation must be very good. Uh, if you want to know what the correlation is, you can go here, equal sign correl, and then open a bracket, and then have your, your, two, your two variables entered like that, separated by commas, and then hit enter. And notice 0 0.9611, a correlation of 0 0.9611 is pretty freaking close. It's really, really close. Uh, it's, a, it's a good correlation. The only thing that might give me reservations about how good this study was is that, lo and behold, we only have nine subjects. We only have nine, nine different points of data plotted. And that worries me because um, the the correlation may look nice, but that could be purely the effect of randomness. And you actually don't know uh, without a larger sample whether or not um, whether or not uh, these points are just due to chance or whether whether we can conclude something a bit stronger here. Generally speaking, a data size would go to say 20. In this case, we're never going to go above that. So the other, the Lang system is going to be, um, um, is, is going to be a separate graph. So um, correlation. As the Pearson product moment correlation coefficient, this is the correlation using the Rogers method. See the, the plotted points generally show an upward trend, just like this graph did. Um, but you can see the points are further apart from the line, meaning that the correlation is weaker than you would get if you were doing this um, using the Rogers method. So we have a weaker correlation uh, between hours of training and score on a um, be, uh, obedience test. And uh, when we take its square root so that we can compare correlation to correlation, we get 0.495, which is, you know, it's it's not a strong correlation. We call it moderate, but we don't call it weak. Weak is when the correlation is below one third, and it doesn't become strong when the correlation until the correlation goes above two thirds, or 0.666 repeating. So if it's below 0.333 repeating, that's the borderline where we start to say that the correlation is weak. And when it gets towards zero, well, then that's going towards no correlation at all. When it goes upward toward one, we're saying that the correlation is becoming more and more perfect. And this one here, the Rogers method, is pretty close to perfect. It's uh, 0.96. So it's uh, really, really good. So this is the correlation. We're, we're going to take this as the correlation because this looks correct of the Lang system. Okay, so that's the correlation of the Lang system versus the correlation of the Rogers system. And uh, so, okay, so that means that we have ways of actually showing you um, not only the regression line, but also the uh, correlation coefficient. Um, what I'm accustomed to doing in this course is having you do these tables by hand. Uh, using a small amount of data. Like for example, here we have nine, a set of nine data, nine pairs of data for each training system. It wouldn't be, you know, it's a, it's a little bit longer a question than I'm used to, but it's not out of character for me to say, okay, let's make a table of this by hand. But in this case, um, doing this using, um, doing this using uh, the spreadsheet is probably how we're going to be going about this for this course, especially when we're online.